Okay, welcome back everybody. Today my guest is Aiku Basin, AK, AK, my cousin also. I'm getting you know, I'm people may think I am biased. I am. He's my cousin, he's great. But this is what everyone else says. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction because I want to get into the meat and potatoes today. So he's born in Michigan, raised in Louisiana, spent some time in Alabama, resides in Atlanta, Georgia. He loves the South, apparently. Loves the South. He went to Southern Eastern Bible School, spent a lot of time at Booster, a fundraising and leadership, and now starts his own thing, Grow or Die. Ike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hey, great introduction. Great introduction. You like that? I like well, it. Well, I'm going I'm to go. I like, I like the accent. I feel like you, accent is your thing, so I was expecting to hear some of it, so that was good. Okay, I love the feedback. We may go other places today, but I'm going to jump straight in today on the leadership and growth perspective. What was your first memory of receiving leadership or experiencing a leader in your world? First memory goes back to being in Louisiana, and I was a part of a youth group, and there was a woman leading it named Miss Peggy, <clears throat> and I always liked her. And I think what I saw, I didn't know at the time, I didn't really know where the, what, what's leadership. We weren't talking about it a lot then, but she just cared the way that she talked to us, the way that she uh, was a part of our world. That was probably the first sign. It was, it was somebody I was like, I look up to this person um, outside of like my parents that was probably the first time where I saw, and this was like me being in uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, where there was somebody that I wanted to be like. The way that she led, it kind of gave me this interest in leadership, even though I didn't know the words for it. I just wanted to do something like that. How can I be able to help people like she is helping people? So she was like the first example that I remember distinctly where that was like kind of a, a push of me wanting to do more leadership type stuff. Do you remember what characteristics about Miss Peggy that drew you to it? Was it just her personality? Was it an example? What was it that, that attracted you? I think something that I saw, she was herself. I mean, it was clear that she was herself. Her personality was showing she was herself. I think she modeled. That's a, another big thing that was important to me then, really important to me now. She was modeling what she was talking about. So to be able to see someone model it was really cool for me to see. Um, also, she took risk. Uh, I think at the time, being in a more conservative church, like she just took risks and really allowed us to try new things. I think that's another thing. There was this sense of empowerment. I remember multiple times where she encouraged me to do things that I was even, I didn't feel qualified or really that good at, but she really cheered me on to try new things. So I think seeing some of that was really, really helpful along with just um, a, a loving person. She was very loving and very caring. I remember really distinct instances where she was there for me um, when I needed someone to talk to. So the, some of those things are probably what I would say. That's awesome. So I'm going to read a, a statement, and it goes back to the Grow or Die, to your leadership company. Leaders have two choices, run the rat race at all costs, or refocus on the right goals and habits that develop healthy leaders. Comes back to Grow or Die, a, a very bold statement. Mm. What, do, what does that mean to you, and why does that guide, guide what you do? Yeah, I think... You know, I'm I feel like I'm still pretty young. I have a lot of life left or willing, you know, I it could be cut short, but I feel like I have a lot of life left. But something I'm learning as I'm getting older is how. When people are in, stepping into their leadership world or leadership life, it's not really long lived or they're not viewing it as a long term thing. It's kind of like in the moment, here's what I'm doing, here's my season. And I've already seen people, peers, friends, who haven't lasted long in their leadership journey. And what I mean by that is they might have been going really, really strong and then it's non-existent or they have a bad fallout. 
And I think for me, when I think about growth and leadership in the rat race is there's this idea that this rat race is always going to feel like it's feeling in the season, right? There's seasons where you feel like, oh, wow, I have all this energy. I have all this excitement around what I'm doing. And this is how it's going to be. But it doesn't work like that. That if you live in that mentality in your life, it's going to eventually start to hurt you, um, both mentally and physically. And so why I love kind of like the slower pace and grow or die based around healthy, sustainable growth is I want people to be leading for the rest of their lives. I want people to be growing for the rest of their lives. But the only way you can do that is if you do it in a healthy way. There's no really good way around that. You might have a season where you're just charging, 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 but you can't charge like that for the rest of your life. So I've seen people have really, really high highs and really, really low lows. And what I want to help people do is find more sustainability. That does not mean you won't have lows. That does not mean you won't have highs. It just means that it's more regulated. It doesn't mean that you're doing great and all of a sudden, five, 10 years later, you're nowhere to be found. Like, how can you sustain your leadership in a healthy way and keep that flowing? So I'm really big on, let's, if you live in the rat race, that's what your life's going to be. But how do you find this pace that's healthy and sustainable? It might be hard to do at first, but it helps you lead for a long period of time. I think about our parents' generation. That was, it, since technology has came in the picture, it's a lot harder to do this because we're so distracted. We never get bored. And so I like bringing in elements of that from the past where you have to kind of slow down. You have to pace yourself. You have to strip away technology from time to time to really be able to see what's really important in life. And that all goes into a healthy pace. So where do you think you started noticing that? Because you mentioned right at the start there, you started to notice that. Was that because you yourself were in the rat race? Were you noticing it in different areas in, in college earlier? Where did you start to notice this? Yeah, you know what's interesting? When I... I think people thrive in one of the two of these areas, probably a little bit more. I think obviously you want to do both, but someone probably is more naturally, they love leading themselves or they love leading people. It's like one, you just naturally flow into one. I naturally flow into leading people. So if I was to get burned out, it would more be on that end. I've learned and grown into and become more skilled into leading myself, but that's not where it was naturally for me. So that was something that I've, I've kind of built over time. And I think when I started investing in leading myself, that's when I started personally seeing, okay, I am going, 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 going. And I'm not really taking any time to really see how am I doing? What, it, what What's going on in my world? Like, is this, is this healthy? And I started developing more of an escapist behavior, which is, you know, I'm, doing all these great things, but I do more things to avoid other problems in my life. And that was something that I realized that this rat race, this continuation of all this stuff can actually harm me eventually if I'm not paying attention. It can become an escape for me. Um, just always finding the next thing to fill a gap so I don't have to deal with any issues or problems, which I think that's a big issue when it comes to leadership. We Doing more can make you temporarily feel the satisfaction you need to fix a problem, but the problem fix is only temporary. So I like saying, let's figure out what's really going on. Um, so that was that was it for me. And then also, I think seeing other leaders around me that I loved and respected have a bad falling, whether it's through character, whether it's um, just they were leading great and all of a sudden they're out of the picture. And so I saw people in my life experience that. And I saw personally how it just really started to impact me when I started seeing this escape instead of like really wrestling with hard things in my life. I think a lot of ambitious and people who fall into that leader category, as you say, can resonate with that. I know I myself resonate with that. And certainly through reflection, sometimes you're like, does it just because you do a lot of everything doesn't mean you're doing the right thing and, and going through that and, and trying to find it. So we've jumped in quick. I want to kind of slow it down now and kind of come back to grow or die. <laughs> One, what does grow or die the statement mean? And two, what was your journey to 
to start in Grow or Die, the leadership and growth coaching? Yeah, great question. So I said it a little bit earlier, but when I think about Grow or Die, I think about healthy, sustainable growth for every leader. And what that really means to me is you really have two choices. Are You're either getting better or you're getting worse. And it's just reality. Everybody knows that to some degree, like, you're going to get better. You're going to get worse. But I also think people struggle to know what does it look like to grow consistently because you hear it and it's like, okay, I need to grow, but what does it even mean? How do I do this? Is that just like work? And I wanted to help people really figure out what it looks like to have healthy, sustainable growth. And it's not just in your action. It's also in your conversations. It's also in the way you think. So typically when people think about growth, they think about action. And that's not always what it comes to when it comes to growth. And so it's really to help people make progress consistently and get better opposed to getting worse. And that's that was kind of like the this whole picture of Grow or Die. I love the intensity of it. I really do. I love the intensity because I want people to feel like you have a choice like you have to make some sort of choice. Now, what the people who get to know me and they join Grow or Die or be a part of what I'm doing, they start to see, oh, I guess really more about healthy and sustainable growth. He, he, he's not trying to get us to just like do a ton of stuff. Honestly, I help people strip a lot away before they add more. But th- that's a big picture of it. And what led me to Grow or Die as a whole, I think in 2016, I read Good to Great. And he talks about Jim Collins, the hedgehog concept. And that that's really probably what helped me get this picture of Grow or Die. Because I, it was at this point of I was in a leadership position with Booster and it was great. And I was diving into this world and I'm trying to figure out what do I really want to do with my life? Is, is this it? Is this where I'm going to go? Or do I want something specifically different? And so in figuring out my hedgehog concept, like what I'm passionate about, what can drive my economic engine, what I can be the best in the world. I feel like what that came to was I wanted to be the best leader developer for the world. It was, it was in the world, but now it's like really for the world. Like what does it take for me to be the best leader developer for the world? It's something I was really, really passionate about. I saw that I can generate revenue for, from it, but also I saw like, man, I can be the best at this. I love it so much. I'm super passionate about it. I think about it all the time. And it's something that I'm constantly thinking about for the people around me. So once I figured that out, I feel like everything kind of started flowing. Uh, Grow or Die specifically came from, I'm seeing something on my, uh, one of my friends at work, he had this, he was in the recruiting space. He had recruiter die. And that's where Grow or Die kind of like, I just kind of took it off of that. I didn't really think it was going to turn into something where I brand my business off of it and all that, but it was really a statement for me. It started for me. It's saying, hey, I, are you willing to commit to this for the rest of your life? That was really, when I think about Grow or Die, that's what I think about. Am I willing to grow for the rest of my life? I know sometimes it's going to get hard, but am I willing to do that? And the answer is yes for me. And I want to help other people do the same, commit to their growth journey for the rest of their lives. So you've read this book, Jim Collins, Good to Great. You're feeling all these emotions towards what you actually want you to do. You've already had some experience in the leadership space with Booster. So all these emotions, these energy, you, you've always kind of mentioned before the seasons. So that was a very positive season for you. How did you then make the transition? Because I'm sure when that actually started, the season may have gone on the decline. So what was that initial uh, period of jumping in to grow or die, like get, having the confidence to do it. And how did you battle that first um, negative season? Because a lot of people will have that energy. Me, myself, were doing a lot of things. How did you overcome that and go on to where you are today? That's a good question. You know, first thing I'll say is I had some really great people around me. One of my friends, Sergio, he's the one who pushed me to start the business. Honestly, I had a lot of insecurities of what I was capable of. I think anybody starting a business or side hustle or whatever, you're probably going to be somewhat insecure. Even if you believe that you can do something great, there's insecurity there to actually put it out there for the world. Because now it's like, once it's out there, people get this opportunity 
to critique it, to judge it, all of that. So there was, there was like some insecurity there. I had a good friend surgery. It was like, Ike, you need to put yourself out there. You need to start something. You have something special. And so he pounded that into me for a good six months when I talked to him. And I think that's what he said. Hey, how about this? This weekend, I'll tell you how to do it. Get your LLC. I don't know what it's like, but when you take that, when you get a small little win of just starting your LLC, that built some momentum. And then from there, there was like this energy. There's this high of like, okay, this is great. I actually had a really big win first. So I got this contract with New Balance stores in the Southeast and it was it was great. It was more than I was getting paid in my job. So I'm like, this is crazy. I think in the midst of that, I take this step. I'm doing this while I'm doing my job. My job knows I'm doing it. So it was kind of like this cool little thing and I'm going to these stores, I'm doing consults, I'm doing leadership stuff. And in the midst of doing it, I hated it. <laughs> I didn't like it. It wasn't what I was expecting, right? So that was like the decline. I'm like, okay, there's this opportunity here. I'm excited about it. And it's not what I thought. And it's made me start questioning is, did I choose the right thing? Because I'm doing what I, at least I guess I thought I was supposed to be doing, but as I'm doing it, I'm not enjoying it nearly as much. Um, they were turning me more into an employee opposed to really being the coach consultant I really wanted to be. So it was, it was really challenging. It made me question it. And so after I did that, I did that for a year and a half. Um, I just paused on everything and I just, I didn't, I didn't do anything with my business. I just kind of like let it stand still. And that was, that was really tough. So that was like this kind of downward slope and believe it or not, you know what picked it back up? It was 2020. <laughs> That's what picked it back up. And what really did it was I had more time to think and reflect. That's honestly, that's what it was. Less noise, less distraction. I really had time to think and reflect and think about what do I really want to do with my life? What? Why am I here? What's my focus? Is this what I want? 2020 probably did that for a lot of people. And that's what it did for me. And that was kind of like the, from the down here, not really doing much with it, focusing more on my job, which wasn't bad, into 2020 comes, I'm like, I need to re-engage with this. I think I got something special. I can do something for this. And I just started taking it up a little bit more. It's a funny time, COVID, the COVID time for a lot of people, although it is a low point culturally or societal for everybody, people who are able to step away reflect really benefit it from ways. And I want to go to a point when you're talking about Sergio Day, you had someone in your corner who was pushing you, uh, motivating you, saying you have got this. I know you today are that person for a lot of people. You are for a lot of different coaching on a personal level, professional, um, personal, but you also have started a club and are doing that for other people. Do you think you can do it alone? Can, can somebody who has all these ideas in their head, but doesn't have a person or community behind them, do you think they can do it alone? So I will say we see people doing it alone, right? So it is possible, you know, the, I like the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think it's less enjoyable when you're doing it by yourself. I also think, it's a lot harder to go farther when you're by yourself. And so I, when it comes to growth, I like to have fun with it. And I think doing it with other people is, is really, really fun. Also, I think there's a sense of arrogance we have when we do it by ourselves. Like we have all the answers. Are you kidding me? The amount that I glean from all these other people is just, it's crazy. I get so much insight from collaborating with people who think differently, who have different experiences and backgrounds. So being in this now and thinking about someone who says like, I'm better off of myself. I'm like, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about until you actually experience it. Then you'll realize all the benefits of it. And you'll also see that you probably can do more with less. So I feel like because I have a great group around me, I don't have to think as deeply on something because I'm, pulling from other people. It's like a mastermind, right? 
you're you don't have to search as deep because you have the people around you so you can focus on what you're really good at. And so I would say that, but also it's just it's way more fun. Um, I think we were built to do things with others. I think we enjoy doing things with others. So when we're by ourselves, I don't think there's as much fulfillment. You can probably make more money if you're just by yourself. There's a lot of things that come with it. But I think long term, it doesn't help people as much and it can lead to more isolation. One thing special about the way you do your leadership and especially your club is that you've you've gamified the the leadership and and growth approach and you've put that into your club which I, i'd like to hear more about one what is the club because i know last year from watch from social media you look like you did some really cool things you did a big event at the end of the year so i want to hear what is that club and who is the kind of people that is coming i don't want to stereotype everyone but who is that kind of person are they you know a very ambitious person or somebody looking is there a, a trend between who's coming there Who, who's coming so the girl i club one the one of the most it's a favorite thing that i do i love doing it it's a lot of fun and great people in it so pretty much it's gamified growth for driven leaders so kind of need to be somewhat driven to be in it or you're not going to enjoy it but it's gamified growth and we have seven different areas we focus on personal development, professional development, people development, play experiential, um, health and fitness, financial health, mental, emotional, spiritual health. So those are our seven different areas. And within those seven different areas, you can earn points. The points range from 10 points all the way to 250 points. And you're doing these things, but it's competitive because there's other people doing it as well. And so you get to see a scoreboard of where people are at. Um, we have awards towards the end of the year. We're doing all these different things. So it's, it's kind of like this ecosystem of growth. And what I love about it, this whole picture of healthy, sustainable growth is people naturally move towards specific areas. So it could be health and fitness or financial health. But because everybody's seeing where they're at, it's kind of like this challenge and push to say, I don't only want to do things in areas that I'm great at. I also want to be challenged to do things in areas that I'm not so great at. So playing experiential is a weakness for me. I typically push that aside, which bothers me, but I do. And so I'm pushed to do more things in playing experiential. And because I also see other people who are doing it. I'm able to glean from them and things like that. And so it is a, a gamified approach to growth. And there's just a lot of different levels to it. We have a coaches system in there once you get a certain amount of points, but you also can get kicked out. So if you don't hit a certain amount of points by the end of the year, you can get kicked out of the club, which actually puts like this, I think a good pressure to it where people are like, well, I don't want to get kicked out because everybody who has been in Q1 they're all back in it for year two. So it's a yearly membership and you could just tell there's excitement and people wanting to step up and grow. And what I always thought about with growth, I feel like sometimes there's this like weird pressure for growth for people. And I hate that. I hate when people are forced to grow, but I want to take the approach. And when I took the approach with the club, it's like, it's all inspiration. I'm not going to come to you and tell you, Hey, what are you doing? You got to earn points. I'm just going to show you what I'm doing. Right. I'm going to show you what other people are doing. So I'm constantly being able to show and post like what other people are doing to grow. And so what's naturally happening, the people who feel like um, I'm just not off to a great start or whatever, they're getting inspired by the people who are growing, which is allowing them to push themselves. So I don't have to tell people like, hey, you're slacking behind. What are you doing? I just show other people's growth and it, it's enough to inspire people to push themselves a little bit more. I think pressure is a privilege for especially driven people. People who want to put that pressure on themselves have to sometimes remind themselves of, of that part. And that's definitely what, what you're doing. And I think the kicking out part is that skin in the game. You know, you, you, sometimes sometimes you need that. What is something that you kind of mentioned there that they are inspired by other people doing it, but stepping away from doing one-to-one -one personal coaching, What is is there anything else from bringing it to a community, bringing growth to a community of people that you, that surprised you in, in that journey compared to the one-to-one -one that you do? The vulnerability 
to be completely honest, we do quarterly retreats and we have something we call hot seat. So everybody has to get in a hot seat and they have to talk about their quarter. And after you talk about it, you kind of get drilled a little bit. People are asking you questions or giving you feedback. And so it's kind of intense to some degree. But the vulnerability is something that I told him, I don't care how big we get, we'll always do these hot seats. And we broke it up into groups because we are getting bigger. But it's something I, I never want to lose because it's literally people are recapping their quarters and then they're getting like this intense questioning and feedback. But the way they're vulnerable about where they are and you got people, some people who are surgeons at the top of their career talking about some real issues in their life. And so that's something I never want to see gone because typically, you know, when someone's doing well or they have the title, we just assume things are going great. So to hear them come and humble themselves enough to say, yeah, actually, here's where I'm wrestling with. And because I gamify things, you can kind of see the gaps, right? So they're able to articulate and openly talk about areas that they're not doing well in and how they want to get better. And they're hearing from other people who may be good in those areas. So I think the vulnerability is something that I think I wanted. I just didn't expect it to be there like from day one. I mean, people, it, it showed me how much people really want a space where they can actually just talk and be real without like this crazy judgment and feel the need to prove themselves. And so that was a culture that I feel like I wanted to create is I was like, I'm not going to come here and say like, I know it all. Like I'm going to be vulnerable as well. And I want to be able to show you guys where I'm at. And I want you guys to be able to do the same. And it's modeled throughout the club. And I just love it. It's one of my favorite parts, but I wasn't fully expecting that when I started it. Wow. That's a, so a culture you created. I also wonder, obviously growing up in England, if that's an American as well. I Because I feel there is more acceptance of vulnerability in America than I do in England. I'd be really interested to see if people from Europe or people from England, if they were in that environment, how they would respond to that. And I think people are from England are here and listening. I'd love to hear, you know, what their experience would be. But going back to Grow or Die, and saying somebody who's maybe net, not even experienced you or just leadership or growth, doesn't even know what a, a, a coach is or didn't know where, where to go for this. What, what would you say your 101 for Grow or Die for somebody who's just looking to get started in, you know, reflecting on themselves? What, what would you first tell them? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I think a big part of what I do is habit building. And so when I talk to people, that's probably the thing that I encourage first is, hey, let's 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 talk about your life a little bit. And, and there's people, I talk to a lot of people who think they want to be clients, but it's just, it's, it's not going to work. I usually can figure it out within like five, 10 minutes, but I'll use that time and say like, okay, let me at least give you some sort of tool that you can walk away with. And usually it goes back to habits is, okay, let's look at your life. What what are some things that you're doing? And if everybody's really honest with themselves, it's they'll realize you, we waste a lot of time. We have a lot of unhealthy habits and I'm not trying to pin that on them, but I'm trying to maybe expose a little bit of, there's probably things that you can bring into your life that could be really, really helpful. I think the challenge with coaching, growth, people are looking to fix stuff. And that's not what growth does initially. You're not, you can't go into with a mindset. If I start reflecting, reflecting, it's going to fix this. If I start working out, it's going to fix this. And we, we go into the mentality of fix. Here's the problem when you go with the mentality of fixing. Once it's solved, you stop. So it's like, oh, I'm good. I got, I got to the weight I want. And then you don't do anything else. Well, that's the problem. So you were growing and then you stop your growth and then you go back down again and you're going to need it again. And it's just never ending cycle. And so what I want people to get about habit building is you're building this habit to become a better version of yourself. And you're not just thinking about this season, you're thinking about your life. So how is health and fitness going to help you when you're 60, 70 years old? Like, is it, playing with your grandkids? Is that something that you want to be able to do? Do you want to still be able to walk and run with your grandkids? Right? 
once they start thinking that way, they're like, okay, well, maybe I can shift some things around so I can have that. You have to have something bigger in your mind. And so I love bringing people into that habit world. Hey, let's figure out one thing. What is it? Okay, right now, mental health is really an issue of mine. I'm, my thoughts are everywhere. Well, I might say like, hey, why don't we try reflecting? This is, this is a great thing. And this is one of the reasons why I created a club. Because people will do that, but if you don't have anybody around you who is like helping you and inspiring you along the way, it can just get really hard. I'm not saying you need that, but it's very, very helpful opposed to doing it by yourself. And so I would start with habits. Let's let's start with one basic habit. It doesn't have to be big. It can be a five-minute habit, three-minute habit. Let's start from there and let's build. And I think that with that with a bigger vision could go a really long way. Makes complete sense. And you have a bunch of resources on your website. You, you, you know, started off with the journals, reflection, prioritize. I mean, I gave those journals as Christmas gifts a couple of years ago. And I know to this day, people are still using them just because of the layout and the questions. But you also have a habit app and a 100 day challenge. Mm. And that's accessible to anybody. Anybody can go and use that. So can you just explain the 100 day cha habit challenge to people? Yeah. So this is something I did at the end or at the beginning of last year, 100 day habit challenge, which <laughs> very, very fun. I think people underestimate how long the 100 days is. I mean, everybody knows it's long, but it's long. But I love that picture because it helps people settle into something. Everybody starts really excited at, at the beginning. And then they're like, there's like this downward slope of like, is this kind of getting boring? I'm like, yes, there we go. That's it. And I, I try to get people excited about the boredom. You're going to get bored. You're going to be wondering why you're doing this. But that is a part of it. You're not building this habit to just feel good. Think about, I think about habit building as a, a legacy builder. Whatever you want for your legacy, that's what you're bringing into your life. So if you want health and fitness to be in your legacy, you need to bring in your life. If you want adventure to be in your legacy, you need to bring in your life because that's not just going to automatically happen for your family down the road. It's just, it just won't happen. You have to bring it in and you have to model it and you have to get reps in it. And then those things are going to start to feed into your legacy. So I love thinking about habit building as a legacy builder. Um, but to, to that point, I didn't do one of those this year, but what I'm working on this year is my own app, which is a really big, just habit building app that I'm really excited about um, that will come out in 2025. So that's kind of like the big thing that I'm focusing on because there's a lot of cool habit building apps, but I just nothing to where I think it needs to be. And I really feel like I can put out something there that will not only be good for the individual, but can make it more communal, which is what I love to do. I, I think growth feels so disconnected is one reason why I did the club, but I think I can bring it in a digital space where it brings some connection to people. I, I can imagine it's like, I immediately think of things like Strava or my whoop groups. It's like where you kind of, bring that community feel to a, a sport or an individual thing, all of a sudden you have this effect of, I want to do this for more than myself, even if it's a selfish, I want someone to give me kudos, you know, yeah. it, it drives you on. Um, so just to growing and going forward in the future, something I've been thinking about a lot recently is how far should I think forward into the future? I find when I start to think so big, I, my, I automatically think big. That is just how I, how I dream at night. But it sometimes distracts me. So every time I try to make my world a little smaller and just focus on the day to day, it works a lot better for me. I know you've mentioned that in different terms, but with you growing your business and it's continuing to scale quicker and quicker, how do you look at growth? Do you, from your business perspective, do you, do you look at it like I've got to think five years ahead? In, or, in order for this to work or let me think year to year, quarter to quarter, how do you usually plan? <clears throat> I think it's a mixture. Um, something that I, I like thinking about uh, the present and then I use like a house and I think about the becoming section, which is a plane. And then the, when I think about vision, I think about the world. 
I probably would say I spend the least amount of time in vision space, casting vision, even though I do it a lot. It's just not as prominent. Um, I would love to say that I spend maybe 20, 30 minutes a day thinking about way out in the future. Uh, I like to spend about, you know, 20% of the time in the becoming stage, which is just me working on things that are happening in the next, you know, one to three years, you know, that's kind of like a lot of like my mission, what I'm working on. But I will say this has been hard for me, but it's something that I fight for. I spend most of my time in the present. And I think that is probably what has helped the Grow It Eye Club grow is people saw that though I am, I'm, I'm just there. I'm there for them. I'm present when I'm with them. And I focus way more on making the club better instead of trying to figure out everything what's next. And I think that's one reason why it's been successful more is that I focus more on the people who are there than the people who will be there, which can be a challenge. It's like, wow, every we're thinking so much about the future. We're like, wait, look what you have right now. And it's this constant battle of like, I, I want to build, I want to grow. But like, man, look at what you have been blessed with right now. Steward that. And then the more is going to come. So I think it's a little bit of a battle, but that is something that I've worked a lot of, I've worked really hard on is being really, really present with the relationships I have. Like be there, have fun with it. And then have some space for dreaming and all that. But if you're not present and you're not making what you already have better, you're going to struggle heavily when it grows. If there was one thing that kept, that helps you keep present the most, what would it be? Probably reflection. I think reflection and then being an active listener. I focus intently on listening well. So, I mean, I, I record all my conversations I have. So, yeah, I, I love listening and I love kind of like spending time really understanding people and what their life is about and where they've come from. So I would say reflection helps me sort out my thoughts because there's a lot swarming in my head, my thoughts, plus other people's thoughts, all that. So reflection helps me to do that. But also like being a, a good listener has really helped me to be present. <clears throat> and then also I would say spending more time in nature. I think if I'm just in my house all the time and I'm not experiencing just nature, being outside, um, going on a hike, going on a walk, I notice a difference. I really do. I notice a difference from when I'm inside majority of the time versus being outside. So to try to do that more has is is another good thing that has been helpful. To just be think, present experience. Absolutely. I, I think this is the same for me. I think nature gives me an instant perspective. If I just step away, especially from a city like Denver, if I go into the mountains and especially if you can see the city from five miles away, but you're here in you can hear nothing. It gives you this perspective that everything else is a bit more manageable and, and you can you can manage it. Looking forward to 24, the rest of 24, you already mentioned you've got an upcoming that you're excited for. What is something else that you're excited for? Is it the club? Is it, you know, your personal growth and development? What's something that's getting you excited for the rest of the year? Yeah, you know, the app is definitely one. I would also say... I am expanding the club into new cities as well. Very, a very slow approach. You know, I, you know, when we talk about scaling and the club members agree, they're like, I have a coaching system for them to keep me accountable. So I run things through them, which is super helpful. But we all talked about how, you know, just this fast growth is just no need for that. So if a city has, it takes a year to get like, 20 people, that's totally fine. It's more about like, let's build the right culture. So I'll be launching in Nashville in Birmingham in 2025. So prepping for that. And then I'll slowly start branching out to more cities to really be able to build it. I think it's just, it's something that I want more cities to experience. And I think this app is going to really help with 
bridging that gap as well. But um, that's probably the other thing that just to be able to build more communities like this in other places, is going to be really big for me. That's exciting. I think hopefully one day it can even go global or abroad because I know there's people everywhere who, who would benefit from it. But I'm going to wrap it up there. Ike, thank you so much. Always a great conversation with you. And I appreciate you coming on, brother. Absolutely, man. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Keep it easy.